souls for Jesus Christ, and I know you have been doing that, and I pray you'd keep it up, and I pray that uh, these few minutes that I have been here these couple of days will be an encouragement to people and uh, help you down the road of life. I'm so honored to have uh, our brother Neil and his wife here all these couple of three days. They stayed for the duration. And I think he said they're heading up to Columbus tomorrow, but it's been a blessing to see them. I've known them for a long, long time. Uh, I don't remember where we met, but it was a long, long time ago. But I, I do appreciate them being here. And Brother Abney, of course, we went to Bible college together uh, way, way back. Uh, again, that's a blessing to see him and the fellowship. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I'm thankful for uh, the privilege and then you putting up with me with a bum leg and uh, I've told a couple people I was preaching a meeting after the surgery and all that and you know they tell me how great I am and how wonderful I am and uh, probably I'm just stupid but I sure wasn't gonna I don't pre I've never preached one sermon with my knee in my life so I didn't figure I'd need it just to uh, preach why don't you look in your book if you would to the fourth chapter of the book of Mark the fourth chapter of the book of Mark and I want to talk to you about a, uh, a story here an incident uh, maybe even an anecdote that happened in the life of Christ and the disciples and I hope we can glean something uh, that will be a help and an encouragement uh, to you folk in the days ahead Mark chapter 4 and verse number 35 the same day when the even was come he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Father in heaven, we thank you for these few verses that we've read tonight and for the things that you've uh, allowed me to gather in my own mind to talk to these folk about tonight. Now I'm aware that what I have just read is far more than black ink on white paper. I've read the very words of God. I have read your words to your people. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help me tonight to say what I feel like I ought to say and I pray that it would be a help uh, to the folk that are faithful here at this place of service and place of worshiping you and we ask it in Jesus name amen there's three little words that captivated my attention at the end of verse number 36 other other little ships other little ships Ships. That's what I want to talk to you about. I think it's human nature uh, to focus on the ship in which the Savior was sailing in. And it's a privilege to be a passenger on board uh, that ship and be there in his very presence. The thoughts are there were other little ships. You see, the storm not only affected the ship and the sailors, that were with him. But the winds of adversity, they also blew universally upon these other vessels. Now your family gets in conflicts and my family gets in conflicts. Sometimes your finances are affected adversely and sometimes mine are advers adversely uh, impacted. Your future sometimes is uh, clouded in doubt and Sometimes there are others in the same boat. You are not alone. There are others in the same turmoil of life. The pastor talked about that a few minutes ago. I thought maybe he had looked at my notes sometimes when I wasn't looking. 
Now, I grew up in Michigan. Don't hold that against me. I wanted to be where my mother was when that took place. So I was born there in Michigan. I found out some time ago, I, I, my dad's an old man, and he, I, I don't know if he kept stuff from us or just never mentioned things to us, but I was conceived in Texas. And I preach in Texas this year, I think five or six different meetings in different places. I, I'll be in Texas uh, two weeks from Sunday in Austin, and then a couple weeks later I fly back and I'm in Arlington and I've uh, got another trip to Texas. Uh, later on in this year so uh, I preach a lot in Texas but my dad told me the other day uh, maybe in June or so stopped to see him uh, and brother Neil would probably get more out of this and maybe brother Abney and, and surely your pastor would know of who I'm talking about and surely our brother that went to uh, uh, yeah the brothers here tonight that went to Landmark forever uh, uh, I went to J. Frank Norris's Sunday school when I was just a little boy. So these ears have heard J. Frank Norris, and he, his ears probably heard mine. I was crying in the nursery, or maybe my mother had to take me out and get me out of there. But uh, we all have similar problems. We all have different uh, circumstances that take place. I was born in Michigan in 1965 when I was a sophomore in high school. General Motors employed over 650,000 men. In 1965, over 650,000 men. Today, General Motors in Michigan employs less than 50,000 people. Great economic upheaval. I mean, Detroit was the manufacturing capital of the world when I, when I was a kid. There are now 50,000 homes in the Detroit area that are under foreclosure. There are 60,000 homes right now that are for sale in Wayne County. That's the county that Detroit is in. I think out of those 120,000, some of those voted for Biden. And nobody was even there. Maybe you voted for Biden. You can come forward and, and confess and get right tonight if you want to. My goodness gracious. So it's not strange that negative circumstances happen in life. Uh, they come across our path. Uh, Paul Harvey, and you'd have to be old to know who he was, he said storms are part of the climate of a normal life. So it's a normal thing to have negative circumstances. And uh, trouble is common to all. Storms beat upon all of our vessel. Uh, sometimes it's physical affliction. I uh, think we buried my kid brother seven years ago. I think he was just 59 or soon to be turned 60. I uh, buried my little sister about a decade, maybe 11 years ago. She hadn't even got to 50 years of age. My brother was a pa assistant pastor with my father for 40 years. My little sister, they were missionaries in New Guinea for over a quarter of a century. I buried loved ones. I have pastor friends that have died, family friends that have died like all of us. I was preaching up in uh, Oregon maybe, uh, maybe a decade ago at the most. And I didn't know the preacher. I think I'd met him once in Idaho. And he was down there. He was assistant pastor in Idaho. And he took this church out in the middle of nowhere in Oregon and I was we were talking and fellowshipping and uh, I just asked him I said how many children did you have and he paused the beat and he said well and I don't remember how many they had initially but he said I had a son he and his wife went out on their second anniversary for dinner and on the way home from their second anniversary they were killed and left behind a little eight or ten month old uh, baby girl. A lot of people have problems in life. A lot of people have difficulties. There, there are a lot of other ships, little ships, besides the one in which the Savior sailed. When Ill, illness strikes, I think it's easy to be self-focused. Uh, you know, you may go out on the deck of your life uh, amidst the lightning's flash, and the thunders roar 
and the billows are raging and the waves are crashing, realize tonight there are others who have problems also. You know what impresses me? I go to, I don't, I'm not a pastor, but to go to church after church after church, place after place after place, and you'll see somebody, it's almost inevitable. Now in this church, I'm the guy on crutches. But in a lot of churches, you'll all see people in wheelchairs. I'll see folks that have those oxygen things on and they're carrying a canister around. And you see people, they have an excuse. Uh, they, they, but they're going to be in the house of God when the doors are open. I tip my hat to people like that. My dad's 93 years old. You know how many services he has missed since COVID hit? One Wednesday night. My dad, we just always went to church. You know, I never got up in the morning, Sunday morning, when I was a kid growing up, Brother Sage, and my mother would come in the room and woke us up, and I would say, Mom, I don't feel like going today. That never happened at our house. You went whether you wanted or not. We went to the house of God. We went to church. When the doors are open, God help us to somehow instill that in some people in our day. You know, sometimes we think our burdens are heavier. Or maybe our sorrows are greater. And we assume when we go to the cemetery that, that grave digging is a, a brand new business that just opened up when the spade cuts the sod for one of ours. But you look around at the cemetery and you see that it's a well-worn path that leads to the graveyard. There's been others who have come and buried their hearts. There's other little ships that have sailed these waters before. A keen observer of ancient days made this statement. Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. It's something that happens. Now, it may seem cold comfort to you that others have problems. You say, I'm concerned about mine. You may say, well, you know, there might be choppy seas, but I'm not concerned about theirs. I'm concerned about mine. I've got a good preacher friend. He's getting ready to retire this month, and he's younger than my wife. Now, how in the world do you get away with that? I don't know. But he's retired. He's got a large church in the Chicago area. Some of you may know Brother Keith Gomez or heard of Brother Gomez, but he's retiring. I mean, he'll probably still preach around and hunt. He does a lot of hunting, too. But uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, Sandra, uh, and I, I loved his first wife. Uh, she was a great lady. I, I love his present wife, Kim. We're all, all good friends. But uh, I talked to Carla uh, on the telephone the day that she died. And uh, when she passed away, we went up to the funeral. They had two funerals, one for outside guests. The next day they had one for the church. It was a large church. And so they just, you know, the building was packed. I would assume both services. I know it was for outside guests. And uh, as soon as it, they buried her in the graveyard, uh, not too far from the church, Keith disappeared. And uh, nobody but his secretary knew where he was for two months. He'd gone hunting. He killed two buffalo. I don't know what else he killed. You say, that's an unusual thing. Teddy Roosevelt, when his first wife died in childbirth, he left that little baby with his uh, sister-in-law, and he went hunting for two years. He was the police commissioner of New York at the time. He just took off and went, and I, I read three or four books about him. My goodness, the tale of tape of the animals that he killed is beyond description. Hundreds and hundreds, yea, thousands. He killed over 10,000 animals in Africa alone. You say, why would anybody do that? I don't know. But you say, well, I would never do that. Your wife hadn't died yet. You haven't had to face whatever that's going to feel like. And God forbid that anybody in this room has to face that. But Keith had a, he had a struggle with it for a while. He told me one day, he said, somebody, you know, when things like that happen, uh, people give you books and they give you this. And, you know, you, I, I, would, I don't give people advice about stuff like that, stuff you don't know anything about. I will say this. There's a book on the back table uh, called Consolation, which is the finest book outside the Bible that I've ever read that's consoling when somebody dies. 
Uh, Mrs. Cowman wrote that book, Mrs. Charles Cowman. She also wrote a book that you may be uh, more familiar with, Streams in the Desert. She wrote that book, Streams in the Desert. It took her seven years uh, to write Streams in the Desert, or really she compiled a lot of wonderful things in that great book. Her and her husband, had, they left Cincinnati and uh, went from God's Bible School downtown here in Cincinnati. I'll tell you this is a wonderful story. I'll take this off my time. Now there's a brother back there. He's going to raise his hand when it gets eight o'clock, and I'm going to quit. Now, okay? Are we are we okay? He's he's going to raise, a, or I'm going to think he's shouting the victory. One of the two. So I have to make up my mind. But but they came here to God's Bible School. They came from Chicago. He was a he worked for Wells Fargo. He was an executive, and they had surrendered to go to the mission mission field to Japan. So they came here to God Bible School and they had a big offering one day and he took off that a beautiful gold watch, diamond encrusted watch, put that in the offering. She took off her diamond ring, her wedding ring, she put that in the offering. And before the thing was over, they decided and they got up and said, we're not going to take one penny of the support that we've raised. We're going to go by faith to Japan. And so they went, uh, they just step out by faith and go. In that meeting a little girl came up and gave them a quarter 25 cents she wrote that down in a little notebook that she kept for the next 17 years that they spent in japan they never came back to the states they just stayed over there now they went there in 1904 1905 back in that time frame they went over there and in the 17 years that they were there now you think about this they knocked on every single door in the country of Japan and gave some literature and presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. That completely wiped out his health. In that time frame, five million dollars came into their hands to do the work of God in the country of Japan. Now five million dollars today would be a pretty good love offering, Brother Sage. I don't know if you've contemplated that or not. But that'd be a good sum of money, man. What would $5 million be like before taxes? They didn't have tax back then. What would $5 million be like when a loaf of bread was less than a nickel, man? They had a you know, ton of money. By, they just stepped out by faith. Well, he, that, took his, that took his health. So they came back to Los Angeles, and uh, she, in the, it took him seven years to die. And in that seven year time frame that he was dying, that's when she wrote that book, Streams in the Desert. And then when he died, she wrote the book called Consolation, which is, in my estimation, one of the most consoling books I have ever uh, encountered in my life. I reprinted it, uh, B&L down in Tennessee, printed it for me many, many years ago. But anyway, uh, Brother Keith told me one day, he said, somebody handed me a little book uh, by Lehman Strauss about uh, his wife passing away and he said I read that helped me more than anything else I said what was so good about it Keith he said this it's just really a sentence or two he said when a person loses their parent they've lost their past when a parent would lose a child that's when they've lost their future but when a man or a woman loses their mate, they've lost their present. We lose your past with your family, you lose your future with a child, God forbid, and you lose your present when you lose your mate. And he said, Lehman Strauss wrote after making that sentence that our God is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. Amen. Say, I'm floating my boat and I've got some problems. I say to you tonight, the Lord is in our vessel. Perhaps the storms that you are facing may bring about a desire for you to compromise. You look at other Christians, you look at singers, you look at other pastors, and you say, well, I, you know, I think if I uh, shaved a little here, I changed a little there, I removed that. Listen, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a preacher that becomes a has-been. I don't want to become a preacher that becomes a used-to-be. I don't want to be a quitter. I don't want to do something that would knock me out of the work of God. If you knew what I knew, oh, my soul in heaven. I'm going to tell you, there are other little ships 
that are bravely riding out the storm. They're steering a straight course. They are following our commander who is the sovereign of the seas. We think we're the only ship. I will say this, there's not a traffic jam out on the sea of life in serving God. But a lot of times, you know, it's, it's choppy. You know, you can't see. You know, if you're on this side of the, uh, the top of the wave, you're down in the trough. Somebody else is down in the other trough of the wave. Uh, you may be shrouded in the fog and, and you can't see others. And it may be in the darkness of night when the moon is not even shining and the stars have hid themselves. Remember, there are other little ships. One of the guys in the Bible, Elijah, he, he got complaining one day. He said, I've been jealous for the Lord. He said, you know, a lot of others have forsaken the covenant. I've stayed faithful. Uh, that I threw down altars. I mean, I have. He said, you know, I, even I, <laughs> I am the only one left. He was saying, I'm the only guy in the ship. I'm the only guy left on the sea. God spoke to him and said, I've got 7,000 others that have not bowed their knee to Baal. I've got 7,000 other little ships that are still afloat, that are still faithful, that are still sailing a straight course. There are other little ships. They're sailing in the wake of the one in which Jesus sailed. They had crews. They had cargo. They had a destination. There was a purpose for those passengers. The little ship sailed because he sailed. He was the first. His boat's the one, the first one that left. And all those other little ships dotted the Sea of Galilee. They were all over the place. Those little ships, they sailed because he sailed. Now I'm going to tell you something. Let me ask you this. I've been saved for over 50 years. Uh, how many in this room been saved for over 50 years would you raise your hand one two three four five six seven eight there's about eight nine of us there's nine of us here tonight. nine of us have been sailing uh, for, for, for a little bit of time but I want you to think about this as you sail your boat there are other little boats following you there are other little ships looking at you there are others out there on the storm-tossed sea and want to see how you stand true and how faithful you are and how you stay by the stuff it's an important thing. It's a vital thing. I tell you, I, I believe this. Any goodness, this is, a, this is a wicked old world. There's nothing much positive you can say about the world. The world is as worldly or more worldly than it's ever been, if you understand uh, worldliness in the Bible. There is any goodness in this world at all. It is experienced in the wake of of the man of Galilee. It's all because of him. Now, I'm going to give a little bit of attention, and I'll be done on time. Uh, I'll give a little attention to the ship he sailed in. Look back in, ch look in chapter, uh, chapter, our chapter, and look in verse number one. And the Bible said he began again uh, to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and set in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. Can you get that picture? He's sitting in a boat, and uh, the whole multitude is there on the shore, and he's sitting there in that boat, and he's teaching them. And uh, there, there is great advantages, I, I must confess, to being in the boat with Jesus. I'd rather sail with him. I, I want to be constantly conscious of his presence in my life. And those others... When this storm ceased, when this, uh, those waves tucked their heads on the, the beach, and when the lightning was quelled and the thunder turned to blue sky, they sailed on a passive sea. They felt the following breeze. They benefited from the fact that the tempest was stilled. They reaped the blessing of following along in their little ships, the ship in which the Savior resided. You know, they didn't know. Could you imagine those guys? Here's these disciples there in the ship with Jesus. They know what went on. They know what Jesus said. They know how he calmed the waves. 
and stilled the waves and, and uh, caused the thunder to quit billowing and all of that. He, they knew. Those little ships, they didn't know. Could you imagine me, one of the guys in that ship, or maybe the captains, oh, they weren't big boats. They weren't as big as this section right here, the a pew. They weren't huge vessels. Maybe eight or ten guys in them, maybe a dozen like the disciples had. If I'd have been one of the disciples, I'd have thrown Judas overboard, I'll be frank with you. And maybe even uh, Doubting Thomas, too. And a couple of them, the other of them did some dumb things over the road of life. But I, the, you, can you imagine how in the world did this happen? I have, ne I have been sailing on the Sea of Galilee for a decade. I have never seen a storm stop that quick. I've never seen things turn around just like that. Now, I want to tell you something, child of God. It can happen in your life. Things can just turn around. Stay faithful to God. Stay true to him. Stay by the stuff. Stay in your book. Stay with the church. Stay with the preacher. God can work things out in a wonderful way. These other little ships were blessed in him, even though they didn't know who the blesser was. <laughs> These uh, disciples, they... I mean, they exclaimed in wonder. Look what it says in verse 41. What manner of man is this? <laughs> what do we have on our hands, fellas? You ever seen any, anything like this happen? And nothing like this happened before. And Jesus can handle the problems. Now, I don't know if there's anybody here tonight that's not a Christian, but I'm an evangelist. And so I try to pull, pull the net out and throw it out every opportunity I get you know you might catch something you never know you're not going to catch anything if you don't throw the net out you're not going to catch anything if you don't throw the worm out there on the, with a hook you know on the end of the pole you know say people have problems too you know lost people you may not think your problems are but listen we're all sailing on the same perilous sea of life the difference is we're in the ship with the savior you're in one of them other little boats. I mean, the Lord could have, he could have stilled the storm before they got in the storm. There wouldn't even have been a storm. He could do anything he wanted to do. And he can do that for you in your life. But, you know, he allows us to go through some things. The preacher talked about it earlier. And a verse of scripture that popped in my mind while you was talking. You remember, and all of you do. Uh, when the Apostle Paul got saved. Now, I think Brother Neal was there when that happened. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But uh, when the Apostle Paul got saved, on the road to Damascus, he was blinded. Guy took him by the hand, led him into Damascus. He was there for three days, blind. God spoke to a guy by the name of Ananias. Ananias had some qualms about making that visit, I'll tell you that. He didn't want to go. He didn't want to go up there. He said, Lord, don't you know what this guy's been doing to us? And finally the Lord said unto him, he said, I want you to go up there because he's a chosen vessel unto me and I want you to show him what things he will have to, what class? Suffer, yes. You imagine, you imagine 21st century soul winning. You go over to someone's house, you sit down there and take them through the Bible and you get, now listen, I want you to trust Jesus Christ because one of the great things that's going to happen to you, you're going to get to suffer. You wouldn't be winning too many souls. But that's the truth of the matter. Suffering is one of the greatest things that can happen in a Christian's life. It, it builds our strength to go through it, to suffer, to take it on the chin. We need to trust him in the storms of life. They prove the depth of our faith in him. The old songs like, My faith looks up to the old Lamb of Calvary. Living by faith. Lester Roloff used to sing that song. That was his theme song on the radio programs. Living by faith. My brother Steve that died and brother uh, Abney knew Steve from Bible college. When he, uh, when his wife was 40, his first wife was 40, uh, maybe a couple years before that, she contracted uh, leukemia. She died at 40 years of age. Just a kid. I mean, just a girl. 40. And uh, we had the funeral, all of us boys. There were five of us boys that are preachers. We all spoke at the funeral. My dad spoke at the funeral. And it was a large funeral, a huge funeral. My, my brother Steve, now, and I said this at my brother's funeral. I mean, there was 
close to 800 people at the funeral. The building was more than packed. And I said, at my brother's funeral, I said, now there's not going to be this many people at my funeral. Because Steve got along with everybody and I hardly get along with anybody. And I said, he, he, he I mean, Steve could, I think Steve could get along with the devil. I mean, he, he just knew how to get along with people. But I don't, I, I'm not that kind of a guy. But anyway, at his wife's funeral, and uh, it was over, and my dad and I would preach funerals together. Uh, I always stood at the foot of the casket, and my dad would always stand at the head of the casket when people would come by. And everybody had come by that wanted to come by, and it was down to the family members, and my three boys were over there with their cousins, and they were weeping. They were hugging their cousins' necks, hugging each other. And the organist was playing that old song, Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. And my kid brother Steve was sitting there in the front row of that auditorium. His children and my children over there weeping, a few stragglers still around, and his wife laying there in the casket and singing, Great is thy faithfulness. God is faithful in the storms of life. God is faithful when the sun's shining bright. God is faithful when the clouds have blackened your life. Hey, these little ships were blessed and will be blessed by the fact that our Savior is in the ship. And lastly, when they, when they get to port, there was no other ship. They all went to their own ports. And they got there, and look what it says in chapter 5 and verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarene. They made it through that storm. And when they got there, I mean there was ministry. There was a devil-possessed man. There was a diseased daughter. And there was a dead damsel. And the Lord came and delivered them all in a wonderful, wonderful way. You know, there was a storm that broke across this old world, I don't know, eons ago. And it rained in that storm for 40 days and 40 nights. I've seen some of the pictures on my phone today of the storm that ravished uh, New Orleans. 16 or 17 years to the day when Katrina hit. Interesting. And uh, I saw pictures, I mean, roofs being blown off, block brick and block buildings almost exploding. It was a, it's an amazing, powerful storm. Nothing like Noah's day when the fountains of the deep were open. Thank God there was one ship built, one great ship built for the saving of the household of the human race. And all the rest were lost save those eight souls. And there were no other ships. And I want to say if you're a sinner here tonight, may this sink into your heart. There is but one way. There is only one ship. There is only one sovereign of the sea of life. There is only one Savior. Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. He trod the wine presses alone. He made the voyage to Calvary alone. He explored the world of the unknown in the midst of the earth alone. He tasted death for every man. And one day heaven and earth will flee away from his presence. And thank God one day I got on the old ark of safety. And I boarded the old ship of Zion. And I, the whole of my soul and the captain of my salvation will stand with me. And I'll be by his side through all eternity. There, neither is there salvation in any other there is salvation in nobody else. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The question I leave at the doorstep of your heart tonight, are you in the boat? Have you got on board? Jesus is inviting us to come, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. If you're not a Christian, you ought to become one you never been born again, you ought to get born again. If you made some spurious little confession of faith and it had not changed you, I said Sunday morning, I believe, I don't believe there's any conversion without conviction. 
Neither do I believe there's any Christian life without consecration. You have got to say to God, you are the only thing that matters to me. I have put my faith and trust in you completely. I have tied my eternal destiny to you and to you alone. There's nobody going to get to heaven on their own good works. There's nobody going to make it to heaven by being a nice guy. There's nobody going to get to heaven by putting more money in the offering plate than anybody else puts in the offering plate. Right. Jesus Christ is the one sacrifice for sin and you must be born again. There is no other way to get to heaven. If you're not a Christian, you ought to become one. God help us tonight. God help us to be faithful. God help us to stay by the stuff. God help us not to have... You know, I worry about, I was going to say pastors, and I know you're not that kind of a guy, but I am worried about pastors that have a pity party every other week. My goodness, toughen up, man. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. We're in it for the long haul. And I'm looking for that hall that hauls us all off. Wouldn't it be great if Jesus came back before 8 o'clock this evening? Hallelujah, man. I'd be one of the happiest, well, I would be among millions of happy people to get to glory and get out of this mess. May God help us. Father, we thank you for these few minutes tonight. We thank you for these three days of meetings, people coming. I know people are busy. Everybody's busy. And I, and I think if I was a pastor, I'd never have been one. I wish I, I would have aspired to have the building as full as it was Sunday morning or even Sunday afternoon. And I don't know the personal agendas that people think they have to submit to. I just wasn't raised that way, Lord, and I haven't, haven't been that way since I've been saved. You just go to church. You're faithful to the house of God. And I pray you'd help these people. There's a fine nucleus of people that are determined, that are faithful. They got their, set, their sails set for heaven. They're in the boat with Jesus. They're in, they're in it with you all the way to the end. And I pray you'd bless them for it. And ask it in Christ's name. You may look up at me if you want to. I'm going to let the pastor give an invitation if he wants to.